let me conclude with this. There are some people who want to blind the masses of the people in America to make Muslims look like they're evil people. But they're not. President, our President Clinton, or the President Clinton, he wants to sign into uh, a law this crime package. You know what I'm talking about, right? 100,000 police in the streets of, of America. Many mayors, they like this. You know, we have a new mayor in New York City. Did you know that? His name is Giuliani. He replaced the first black African-American mayor in New York City, David Dinkins. I knew him very well, David Dinkins, that is. He had became very uh, friendly with African-Americans and with Muslims. I remember he invited uh, me once to home for dinner, and uh, we were sitting down talking. And the mayor said, you know, um, he said um, he was married to his wife, Joyce, for like 30 years. And he was talking to her one day and said, Joyce, aren't you so happy that you married me, the mayor of New York City, instead of marrying that construction worker you used to be interested in? She looked at him and said, Dave, had I married that construction worker, he would have been the mayor of New York City. <laughs> Thought that was very interesting. But now, David Dinkins is gone, gone. And we believe a lot of racism had to do with him now out of the seat of office. But you know what? Many mayors now want this tough fight against crime. Let me tell you something. One day I was looking at my congregation. I'm the imam of a congregation. On Friday prayer service, we have like 600, 700 people that come to the, to the mosque for prayer. And I was looking at some of the brothers and sisters, some of them African American, some of them Arab, some of them European American. And I was remembering some of the brothers that I sat there are some of the same brothers. I went into prison and gave them, the, uh, showed them the teachings of Islam, and they converted in prison, hardened criminals. And you know what? You would never tell. If you come to our mosque and you look at the Muslims in our community and you find out where they came from, you would never believe it, the kind of lives we used to live. Say what you want to say about Muslims and Islam, but you know one thing you have to admit, it makes a change on the people. One of the best examples is a man named Malcolm X, al Haj Ali Shabazz. You know what kind of life he lived. I think they had a documentary on him just recently. Did you see it? Did, did it show here? How many of you saw the movie Malcolm X? So you know, and read the autobiography of Malcolm X, you know the kind of life that he lived as, as I think they called him uh, Dirty Red or uh, some kind of red. Something? No, yeah, something red. But anyway, but he was transformed. Now, brothers and sisters, I want to spend the next few moments trying to um, tie this thing together, try to make you understand. I think that there's some elements in the government that are petrified with the rise of Islam. Some of them are afraid because of ignorance. Because somebody is feeding them something negative against Muslims. Others know what they're doing. I think some elements in the government and in the media and in big business, because when you think about it, brothers and sisters, the United States government is big business. They're so concerned with Muslims and their resources around the world, and they always want to control it. Therefore, they paint Muslims in this broad brush of fundamentalists, which is supposed to trigger in your mind terrorists, so when they want to use that term against any nation that may no longer agree with the policies of America, then they can paint that 
as a terrorist nation and the masses of the people, American people, were ready to respond to it. I give an example. Iran was once on the list of Friends of America under the Shah of Iran. But when there was a popular revolution there that overthrew the, what many believed to be the oppressive regime of the Shah, then the United States government turned against them because these people were independent in their politics and their economics. And they wouldn't allow America to control their destiny. Watch the country Sudan. I tell you the truth, brothers and sisters, I've been to Sudan. I've been all over the world. I can honestly say, although I love Mecca, I love Medina. I love to visit Mecca because that's the place where the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, was born. This is the place where we make Hajj or pilgrimage. I love Mecca. I love Medina, the city of the Prophet. And I would go there to visit all times. I've been there maybe 13, 14, 15 times. But the country in this earth that I really love is the Sudan. The people in Sudan are some of the nicest people you ever will meet on this earth. Their hospitality is so nice. I was in Germany. I was on an airport in Germany. And I met a young man, 19 years old, named Mohammed. I spoke to him for a few moments at the airport. I said, I'm going to Sudan. I said, I'm staying in the Grand Hotel in Khartoum. And you know, one day I was in my hotel in Khartoum, in the Grand Hotel, and one night, who's knocking at the door? That same young man, Mohammed, that I met in Germany. He says, brother, I want to invite you to my house for dinner. A stranger. He didn't know me as Imam Siraj. He knew me just as a Muslim that he met in Germany. And you know what? I got, I said, okay, brother, because you can't say no. You don't say no. When you get invited for dinner, you don't say no. You, it's, a, it's against custom. You have to go. So I said, okay. And you know what shocked me? When I got out of my hotel, we walked to his car. All of a sudden, three men approached and asked this man, where are you taking Imam Siraj? These were security protecting me, which I didn't know. I didn't even know. He said, I'm taking them to my house for dinner. They said, okay, we're going with you. So they invited themselves. And you know, brothers and sisters, they had a big spread of food. And this, this family was relatively poor. But yet they did all of this for their guests. One statement of Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings be upon him, I learned, I felt the reality of it in that country in Sudan when the Prophet said, Whoever believes in Allah on the last day, let him treat his neighbor with honor. And whoever believes in Allah on the last day, let him treat his guest with honor. And they treated me with honor. And in the Sudan, they will not let you go until you take a nap in their bed. I was invited to dinner by the president of Sudan. We went to the castle. And the security guards that were with me, when they got to the, whole, when they got to the castle, they put their hands up, you know, to be, to be checked. And I said, well, me too. I put my hands up. They said, no, no, not you, Imam Siraj. Can you imagine me going to the White House and Mr. Clinton said, no, Siraj, come on, not you. You don't have to be checked. <laughs> and the people in Sudan are so nice, so lovely. And you know what? Economic development is happening in the Sudan right now. There's enough resources in Sudan to feed the entire Muslim world. It is a strong country. It is a growing country. But it's a country that wants to rule their people by Islamic law, by the Quran and the Sunnah. And guess what? Sudan is on the list of the United States government as a terror, terrorist-sponsored nation. And you know what? It's a lie. The See, I learned this. Some of the nicest people in the world are Sudanese. Legend has it. Legend has it. That if you go to Sudan, and if some chance someone has to rob you, they spend a half an hour apologizing. I'm sorry, I don't, I'm sorry, I'm so, please don't, don't. That's legend. That's legend. 
but they are the nicest people in the world. And I say this, brothers and sisters, really, if the United States government did a true analysis of Muslims, they would find them to be a good people and good for this country. If you want to have a neighbor, I don't think that there's a better neighbor to have than a true Muslim. A so-called, what you call fundamentalist, meaning one who really believes in the Quran and in the Hadith or the Sunnah or the practices of Prophet Muhammad. There's no better, I believe, on the earth. I'm not saying that anyone else is not a good people, but if we practice our religion, you will find the Muslims the greatest people in the world. Do we believe in our religion? Yes. On the way here, we came from um, Des Moines. We, we drove from the airport. And I hadn't yet made my um, prayer called Asr prayer, my fourth prayer. And it would have taken us too much time to get here. I would have missed the prayer. Now, what I did may be considered fanatical to some of you. But the brothers put, took their car. Brother Muhammad, I think, put the car. We went to a gas station, and I found me a little space, and I made my prayer. I have prayed in the airports of Kennedy Airport. I have prayed in, in London Airport, because it was time for prayer. Muslims pray five times a day. To some Americans, that looks fanatical. When you look at Muslim women, how they're dressed, when they wear scarves, even in the summertime, they wear long dresses. And American liberated women look at them and say, why do you do that? Why are you cover like that? And to them, it is a sign of backwardness. But these women who cover themselves only cover themselves for the pleasure of Allah, and they try to be modest. So they don't uncover themselves except for the privacy of their homes with their husbands. And so when American women look at that, they say, no, Islam is backward, and that's fanaticism. And when they say fundamentalists, they mean fanatics, they mean terrorists, they mean extremists. Are we extremists because in the month of Ramadan we fast for 30 days? Are we terrorists because we believe in our God and we pray to him? Are we terrorists because we take from our wealth and give some to the poor? This is Islam, and this is the fundamental teachings of Islam. Are we in fact fanatics because we believe in life after death and that we live our life because we believe in life after death and try to live the best life we can on earth? No, we're not fanatics. We try to be good people based on the plan and so on. And I leave you with this. You may not know this, but I tell you this. Muslims don't like to fight. They don't. We try to do everything we can to avoid a fight. But you know what? But when we're forced to fight, then we know how to take care of business. This is the spirit. You have to study the history of Islam. When Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, was being persecuted in Mecca, he was forced to make migration to Medina. In all those years, 13 years in Mecca, being oppressed, the Muslims didn't fight back. You know why they didn't fight back? Because Allah did not command them to fight back. But it wasn't until Medina, finally, Allah revealed in Quran, "A'udhu billahi min al-shaytan al-rajim, wa qatilu fi sabilillahi al-ladina yuqatiluna kum wa la ta'adadun inna Allah la yuhibu mutadin." and fight in the way of Allah, those who fight against you. But yet, do not go beyond the boundaries, for Allah loves not those who go beyond the boundaries. So if a Muslim has to fight, even in the fight, because he's Muslim, there's protocols in the fight. You don't go to a land and fight and fight women, old people, you don't burn down people's property. You don't burn down trees. So even in fighting, in war, there's directions from Allah the Almighty. And you don't go beyond the boundaries. And when people stop fighting, they put down their arms, then you don't have to fight them. And I say this to you, brothers and sisters. Look what's happening in Bosnia now. Bosnia 
is an embarrassment for the Muslim Ummah and it is an embarrassment for the governments of the world, all of them. The American government, President Clinton, the Congress have admitted that the people in Bosnia are being oppressed. Why don't they move against the Serbs the way they moved against Iraq? If you study the policy of this country, you'll see it's not one of support of Muslims. I say this to you, be careful, non-Muslims. You must get hold of all the Islamic literature that you can get, basic teachings of Islam, so that when people write against Islam, at least you have another opinion. And for Muslims, I have something else to say to you in my conclusion. If this is happening, if you're reading books about Islam being terrorist, if you read newspapers, magazines, and over the radio and TV, my question to you is this. What do we intend to do about it? In New York City, we decided the Magistrate Shura that we're going to fight back in the way that we know how, and that is through the media. We got our own magazine. We just started it. And we're not going to end there. We want to get a daily newspaper and fight them the way they fight us. And you know what? We don't intend to stop there. We're looking now to buy a television station to have our own programs on there. And we don't stop there. We intend to buy a radio station and everywhere. Let the voice of Islam be heard. Let the people know what Islam is. And you want, you want to hear what? The best way to show what Islam is, you don't have to give a speech. The best way to show what Islam is is to live Islam in your classroom, on your job, in your neighborhoods. And when your neighbor sees you, and see the way you act with your family and how you are on the job in school. They say, you know what? I may not want to be Muslim. I don't believe as they believe. I don't believe in their theology. But yet that man, Muhammad, and Ahmed, and Fatima, and Aisha, my friends, my neighbors, they're good people. They're wonderful people. Let us show the American people. And I say this to you, Americans, non-Muslims. You may not understand what I'm saying. You may not agree with me. But I say this to you, in a real sense, one of the greatest things that ever happened to America is to have Muslims on this shore. Because we also live here, and we have a vested interest. This earth is inhabited by Muslims and Jews and Christians and Buddhists and Hindus and agnostics. 196,940,000 square miles of earth. We breathe the same air. We drink the same water. We have an interest. And if this country goes down, all those in it go down together. We're in the same ship. And if we allow them to take the ship down, then we go down with it. No, we're not terrorists. No. Try our best to be good Muslims. May Allah bless us and guide us and help us. I mean, assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much. Now, brothers and sisters, what I, to me, this is the main course. I want to take a few moments. I know some of you are itching to ask a question or make a statement. And I want to first say this before you do. Thank you very much for every one of you who came. You're very gracious and you're very kind and considerate to sit and to listen to us uh, make a presentation. Um, thank you for your generosity. Uh, I would like now to entertain questions. Okay, anyone like to make, uh, ask a question or, or make a statement? And, and also, feel free, uh, brothers and sisters, in a sense of freedom, but you don't have to, you know, you can be strong if you like. We have no bodyguards here. You can ask any question or make any statement you like. Thank um, you very much. Feel yes. Feel free to stand up. We also have papers on the chairs if you want to write your questions and sit. But feel free to write your questions and hand them to the people who are walking around. First one, yes, sir.
Uh, it's a good question. Um, if, if the brother's raising the question, um, is, it, is it fair to just put um, on non-Muslims um, given putting the term Islamic fundamentalist because some Muslim countries doing it too, yes, it's true. Um, some Muslim governments. It, it was originated in the West but picked up by some Muslim countries, Muslim governments that signed with the American government. Um, and, and I do agree with you, brother. I would love to see better examples in the Muslim world of countries that are good representations of, of, of as, as governments, that is, of, of Islam. And hopefully we're beginning to see that in some of the Muslim countries, especially, in my opinion, in Sudan, especially. Thank you. Yes. Also, if you're too shy to, to raise your question, you can write them down. Yes, sir. Absolutely. And if there are any Muslims, as I said in my, in my beginning, there are some Muslim terrorists. There are. And uh, as there are Muslim and Christian terrorists and Jewish terrorists. So if they're doing that, that doesn't represent the teachings of Islam. Our prophet has always taught us to be moderate, and not to be extreme. Even in, in worship, there's one person who wanted to um, pray all night long and wanted to fast every day. Now, this is a very righteous deed, but the prophet even prevented that kind of extremism. He said, I'm the best of you. He says, I fear Allah, and, and I know Allah more than any of you. But yet, he prayed at night, and he slept some. He would fast, and he would break his fast. He didn't fast every day. He prohibited any follower of fasting more than every other day, the fast of David. So when you study Islam, Islam is against all extremism. We're against uh, uh, um, innocent people being killed. Let's take the World Trade Center bombing. I don't know who did it. Right now, the trial is going on in New York City. And I believe these, these people are innocent. And, and, and really, you have to go according to the evidence. We've, been, we've gone to some of the, some of the trial. And, and let me just uh, share this with you in case you didn't know. Many of you, maybe you, uh, you heard about it. But the prosecutors had a key witness. This was their like, ace in the hole who could recognize two of the Muslims supposedly who drove the van that contained the bomb. So on the day of the court, he asked the witness, are these two people here? And he said, yes. He said, point them out. He went to the jury box and pointed two people in the jury box. <laughs> that was their key witness. So, so, but whoever did that is absolutely wrong, without a doubt. Let me tell you why. For many reasons. You don't kill innocent people. If a Muslim did it, how do he know who was in that building? Even I, as a Muslim, could have been there. My wife or my children could have been there. But regardless, there were Christians or Jews or whoever, even non-believers, it doesn't make a difference. You don't have a right to kill innocent people. Based on what? What can he show us in the life of Prophet Muhammad? And that's why I said the premise of my talk is the verse in the Quran, obey Allah and the Messenger and those charged with authority among you. If you differ, refer back to Allah and the Messenger. And Prophet Muhammad is the example. Where did Prophet Muhammad do that? So this is not right. If you're going to declare war on someone, a legitimate war, you declare war and you fight. You don't kill innocent people. So we're against that, whoever did. If it happens to be Muslims who did it, we would condemn the act of those Muslims. So, so, so what I'm saying is that this term, Islamic fundamentalist, see really is left most of the times undefined by the writers. Uh, a, a newspaper reporter from the Daily News came to my office once to visit me. He said, Imam Suraj, I'm going to ask you some questions. She says, isn't it true that you went to Sudan? I said, yes. He said, you mean you went to Sudan um, with those fundamentalists? I said, sir, what is a fundamentalist? He said, a fundamentalist is a... a, 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 a. And, and he never answered me. Wallahi, he never answered me. Because a lot of times, they don't even know what they're talking about. They don't even know. They use the term, they hear the term, and they use it. But really, what does it mean? And they ought to start defining it. But they don't define it. And the reason that they don't define it is that they see these journalists are very smart. They know what they're doing. By the way, you have to get this book. 
No, you have to get this book too. It's called Unreliable Sources, A Guide to Detecting Bias in News Media. Excellent book written by a man named Martin Lee and Norman Solomon. These are not Muslims. But this book shows you the bias against women, against blacks, against Arabs, against Muslims, and they show you many, many, many cases, many examples of this media bias. You gotta get this book, Unreliable Sources, written by Lee and Solomon. So I'm saying that they use these, these phrases so that people can uh, get this emotional response and not make a critical examination case by case. Give me no, let me give you another quick example. There are three major groups of Jews. What are they? Hmm? Reformed Jew? Huh? Messianic? Ma the main groups, I mean, main. You have the Orthodox, you have the Conservative, and you have the Reformed. Now, I, we had some lawyers. One was a Reformed Jew. And uh, we, were, we were meeting one day in the office. And we had stopped for lunch. And he got a ham sandwich. I said, wait a minute, man. You can't eat ham. Oh, no, so I'm a Reformed Jew. No, this is, this is to me, preposterous. You, do, does one become so Reformed that they go away from the very essence of their teachings? Now, I'm saying that the, the, some people might call orthodox Muslims, uh, 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 Jews, some people may call them uh, um, fundamentalists. But you don't read about fundamentalists. But yet, the, a lot of their thinking, a lot of their uh, principles are similar to Islamic principles. They believe very strongly in the Torah, but yet they're not labeled as fundamentalists. Muslims are. And I think that is a, that they mean it in a derogatory sense to make people think that Muslims are all terrorists. Uh, yes, another question? Yes, sir. Oh, man. <laughs> Listen to me. What I'm about to say is going to get me in trouble with some of my Muslim brothers and sisters. So I'm telling you that from the beginning. Now, brothers and sisters, don't, don't get me, OK? But let me tell you this. In, in my opinion, this is my opinion. All that I know about Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him, during his lifetime, people not only said bad things about him, they spit on him. They even hit him. And they threw all kinds of um, foul things on him. And he was never the kind of person, even though some of his followers would want to kill them, he would always stop them. I remember once reading that the people of a particular town in Tithe rejected him so much that the angel Jibril came and said, here is the angel of the mountain. Allah heard what they have done to you. Command the angel and he would drop down stones on the people and the Prophet Muhammad peace and blessings said no. Maybe someone in their future generation might hear the truth. This is the Prophet Muhammad that I know. I would never have done that with Salman Rushdie. Let me tell you what I would have done. If Salman Rushdie or anyone else comes and fight us with a book, satanic verses, I would fight him with a book, angelic verses. I would get on Ted Koppel and debate him as he debates. Why do I say that? I have read books. My home is a library in a bookstore. I spend my money on books, and I go to the library, and I read. And I've read many disparaging things against Islam, hateful things against Allah, against the Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessing be upon him. I don't feel like I want to kill the person. I feel like, A, I want to talk to the person, maybe they misunderstand, and number two, I want to get to the people that they got to so that I can show them that this is, this is preposterous. I think to put a, uh, in, in, in this day and time, in this context, to put that um, death sentence over someone, plays in the hands of the enemies of Islam and make Muslims look bad. This is my opinion. Some brothers and sisters, they can agree with me or they can disagree with me. I don't think it's, it, it served us any purpose. 
Now, I understand the thinking. I love Prophet Muhammad, but I say this to my brothers and sisters. We are outraged. I felt very outraged what he said about, I read the book, by the way. Horrible book. Oh. Did anybody read Satanic Verses? You can't, you can't read it. Anybody read the whole thing? You can, you did. Maybe me and you are about the only ones who read the whole thing here. But if we hadn't said anything, a very few people would have read it. But we made Salman Rushdie like a martyr and sold him books. But people said, what is this that he, he it's a horrible book, in my opinion, in my opinion. And I read, it's a horrible book. And I had to, you know, I did, you know, I, I take speed reading. And that's probably the fastest book I've read in my life. So I think that um, we need, in this day and time, in this uh, context of freedom of speech, allow people to say and then to fight against them in the same way with the pen. I say this to my Muslim brothers and sisters. We're talking about someone, you can't hurt Prophet Muhammad, peace and blessings upon him. You can't hurt him. If you write something against Prophet Muhammad and you feel bad about it, I say this to my Muslim brothers and sisters, Muslims are being killed in Bosnia. I want to see that same indignation manifested there and in other ways. So again, this is my opinion. I understand why the brothers and sisters did it. Any Muslim feel outraged to say such things against our prophet, against the wives of the prophet. But to do that, I think it plays in the hands of the enemies of Islam. Now, I want to avoid having a debate about that tonight, because I know what can happen. So that's my opinion. You asked me as a speaker. Now, what happens at the end of the program, at the end of the program, if someone wants to you know, debate that, they could do it. But I don't think now is the time to do that. That's my opinion as a speaker. Okay. My question is about the Imam of New Jersey who was arrested and charged with the World Trade Center bombing. What happened to him and where is he now? You're talking about Umar, Sheikh Umar Abdurrahman. Sheikh Umar Abdurrahman, brothers and sisters, this is, this is, a, a, this is a, a travesty of justice. This is a horrible. Here's a man that the United States government has no, nothing against him at all. They're charging him with um, being the mastermind behind the World Trade Center bombing based on uh, lectures that it gives that may con contain the word jihad. Horrible. Right now he's in, he's in, the, um, in the, the federal uh, prison in New York called um, um, whatever, it's the federal prison of New York City. That's, that's where he is now, whoever wrote the question. Yes. Yes, sir. Where? Who bound? Who banned it? And he said what now? Who has banned it where? Uh -huh, yeah. You I, I I heard something about it. Um I think the what it, in the early part of the book he talked about Malcolm's life before he became Muslim. And in that time, during that time, like I was, I told you, I was a racist. Malcolm was too. So that part there, they, they were afraid if little children read that, they may not understand the, the significance and the difference. So I think that that's, that's what they were talking about. But in general, I, I think that um, in the atmosphere of the First Amendment, freedom of speech, that certainly we shouldn't ban anything like that. See, the problem, brothers and sisters, when you start banning one book, then other people want you to ban, you know, ban your book. Um, oh, by the way, brothers and sisters, before you go, there's some Islamic literature on the desk there. All of it is free um, on this side. <laughs> on the other side, there are lectures um, by myself in different parts of the world. There's both videos and audios. And... Um, We've given lectures in, in just about every kind of topic. To me, three, three of my favorite talks that even that I enjoy is one called Back to Basics. It's the best I've ever done, inshallah. Another one called Why Muslim Women Cover. 
you know, I did a whole, we did analysis from the Quran and the Hadith, why Muslim women cover. In fact, uh, many Muslim women who did not cover, after listening to that tape of, of viewing the video, started covering because I put some very <coughs> compelling arguments from the Quran and Sunnah what, and the wisdom why Muslim women cover. Also, another one called Understanding and Accepting the Unique Nature of the Woman. People told me as far as London that when they heard this tape that it saved their marriage. Understanding and accepting the unique nature of the woman is a bad tape. So if you get an opportunity, if you have a couple of dollars, we ask for donations of $5 for the audio. Any two audios you get, you get one free. The videos, we ask for donations of $15. Any two you get, you get one free. If you're really feeling good, you get the whole set, you get 50% discount. So please, before you go, also get the literature free and also stop by and get a donation. Pick up a tape and get a donation. If it is true, the Muslim nation became um, the only the one superpower, will the true Muslim nations fight to make all the nations under its control? Absolutely no. Will, in other words, if all the Muslims came together under one nation, one big superpower, if you would, would then they fight to make other nations under its control? Absolutely not. Because of a fundamental version of Quran, la ikraha fi deen. There's no compulsion in religion. You can't force people to become a Muslim. In fact, if you force the person to become a Muslim, it negates the very thing of faith. Faith means that you yourself believe in it and you accept it. I became a Muslim based on what I read of and learned of the faith, not because someone forced me to be it. Wonderful religion, wonderful way of life. We got time for two more questions. One, how many people have questions? One, two. Good, okay, these are the last two. Starting with you. I, I, you know, that's, that's an excellent question. No, stop now, you're doing good. Let me, Islamic terrorism has caused this. He, he raised a very, very crucial point. What happens, the media, what the media does, you ever notice if you're watching the news and let's say something happened in Iran and you see people demonstrating and they never give you critical analysis. That is the medium. All it shows is if these, these Muslims are crazy fanatics and they're doing some terrorism with no, no, no connection, no why, what was the cause? Now, in some areas of the, of, of the country, when Muslims have been oppressed and they feel that they cannot take it anymore, they may fight back in the only way that they know how. And that may um, result in what some people would say acts of terrorism. Now, this is not to condone any acts of terrorism, but let's make a distinction between a person's fighting for liberation and violent, random acts against innocent people. But the United States government, Israeli government, other governments, have done equally in terms of what we would say terrorism. So let's not make a distinction as if the only terrorists in the world are a pocket of some individual Muslims at places and then we ignore all the others. And also not deal with the other aspects of Islam. For instance, Algeria, perfect example. Here are the Muslims saying, okay, we're not gonna have a revolution. We're not gonna overthrow the government. We're going to do it by the ballot. So the Muslims get together in Algeria, and they win the election, and then the government says, no, the election is no, no, no longer, it's not valid. Where is the United States outcry? See, it's these inconsistencies that, that the people, Muslims all over the world see, that America plays this double game. Yes, ma'am. Oh man, that's a good question. Wow. What? By the way, one thing you may not realize, I was shocked when I started traveling around the country, how many European Americans are converted to the faith of Islam. But when you look at it, far more African Americans are converting. And I'll tell you why I think, in my humble opinion. Traditionally, whenever a prophet came, or the truth came to the people, 
usually the downtrodden first accept it because they have nothing to lose and they feel themselves oppressed. This country, something happened in New York City recently, and I, I want to say this to kind of tie this together. Last week, did you hear, how many of you heard of Minister Farrakhan? Raise your hand. Minister Farrakhan came to New York City, I think last week or two weeks ago. About 15,000 basically black men came out to hear him. About a week's notice or two weeks' notice, something like that. About a month before that, he had a rally in Jacob Javits Center in New York, about 30,000 people were there. Now, I used to be in the Nation of Islam. Farrakhan is the head of the Nation of Islam, once headed by Elijah Muhammad. Now, people understand the difference. Muslims who understand the difference know that that group are not Muslims. You know, they, they, and how you determine a Muslim is not what I say, but based on Quran and Sunnah. And I just tell you this very briefly, so just to get an idea, and I'm, 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 gonna, I'm gonna make a point here. In Islam, the fundamental belief is the belief in the one God, Allah, creator of the heavens and the earth. In that movement, we believed that a man named Father Muhammad was Allah. This is shirk, this is the worst thing you can do in Islam, to associate God with God. And when you believe that way, you can't be Muslim. Also, they believe that Elijah Muhammad was the messenger of Allah. You can't do that. If you, if you call yourself Muslim, you believe that Prophet Muhammad was the last messenger because it says in the Quran and the Prophet said it. But yet, he says he's Muslim. And many people came there thinking that, that this is Islam. And so sometimes people come and they say, well, um, your leader, Farrakhan. But yet Farrakhan is a leader of some group that they call black Muslims, but not into the mainstream of Islam. But there's something strange happening now. I believe, by the way, and, and I pray that I'm right, many of them, if not most of them, will in fact become Muslim. The same way that Malcolm X did. The same way that Wadith Muhammad, the son of Elijah Muhammad, did. The same way that Muhammad Ali, the great boxer, did. The same way, did you ever hear of uh, Jeffrey 12X? He was a black Muslim, and he became, you didn't hear of him? Yes, you did, that was me. That was me. And, and we became. I was, a, I was a minister in the nation of Islam. A minister. But once they hear Islam, they become, many of them, convert to true Islam. I think, and my, my prayer is, that Minister Farrakhan will convert to become an Orthodox Muslim. I spend hours talking to him every chance I get. And I will continue talking to him, trying to convince him that this is the right way. I think it's going to happen one day. And I say this, this is between us. Is this being taped? Yes. But you keep it here, okay? One of his ministers came to my house. He was the minister over one of the temples. One of the ministers and their lieutenant came to my house. And I spoke to them at three o'clock in the morning and both of them became Muslim. And when the minister went back to the temple, the first topic he taught was Tawheed, the belief in the oneness of God. Okay? So, and, and, and guess what? When the minister Farrakhan came to New York, he called him Imam, Imam Siraj. See? So, the report is there so that we can continue to invite. The reason I say that, brothers and sisters, a very beautiful verse in Quran, Allah the Almighty told Prophet Moses and his brother, Prophet Harun, Aaron, right? He says, he says, اذهبا إلى فرعون إنه تغى وقولا له قال لينا لعلهم يتذكى أو يخشى You two go to Pharaoh. He's gone beyond all boundaries and say to him gentle words. Perhaps he would receive admonition or fear God. So therefore I tried to talk to Minister Farrakhan hoping that he would become Muslim. Now, the reason I say that since I come back to this point I believe that right now the masses of black people are looking for something. I think many Americans are looking for something, especially black people who feel right now really oppressed. I'll give you some examples. In New York City, they have um, a lot of homeless. And so what some people do, they take, it, it's called a squeegee. You know squeegee, huh? 
And what they do, these people, homeless people, don't have a job. They stand on a corner, and when your car comes, they come to wipe your window and, you know, and ask you for a little something. This new mayor getting tough on the squeegee people. Told them, if you keep on doing it, we're going to put you in jail. He cleaning up the squeegee people on the trains in New York City. Subways. You have subways there? <laughs> on the subways, homeless people out begging. Begging. They have a job. The governor, the mayor, come down on these people. They got tough on them. Right now, if you read the newspapers, Wall Street Journal, how many people, thousands and thousands of millions are losing their jobs? Now, cutting off the welfare, you can't beg, you can't even squeegee, 